In our last example, we used Microsoft Excel to sample an infinite population of patients in an intensive care unit. This set of patients is an infinite population because the numbers are continually changing. The patients who are in ICU today will very likely be different from the patients who are in next week. The patients could change by the hour. There's a constant turnover. And anytime we measure this population, it is going to be different. However, we could think of this as a population that represents everyone. For many people, for most of us, the chances of ending up in ICU involve things that are out of our control. And so we are all candidates for perhaps ending up in an intensive care unit. But here's a little secret. Because there are a limited number of patients in this data set, we could think of it as a finite population. However, for this example, we're treating it as an infinite population for the purposes of learning. So unlike most infinite populations, we can know something specific about this population. For instance, we can know the actual mean, standard deviation, and sample size and then use that to make comparisons of how close our estimators are to the true values. Let's review this data set. We started with a data set that had a population size of 4,194. Everyone in class did an example of choosing randomly 30 patients from that population. Assuming that we had 30 students in the class, we would have 30 random samples from the same population, each with the same sample size of 30 and a mean of X bar. Which of these values of the mean of the sample should we use to estimate the population? And again, we're not going to choose just one. We want to average all of those means and use the mean of the means as our estimator for the population value. I have more to say about this idea of creating a mean of the means. But to do that, I want to illustrate it with something I call stats blocks. What we have here is a number line. And this number line is going to form the basis for what I'm going to show you next. I also have two bags. This bag is our infinite population. Now, obviously, I don't have 4,000, but I do have some numbers in this bag. And I could sample from this bag by selecting some numbers at random. Of course, I can create a mean by adding up all of the numbers and dividing by the total number of numbers. Over here in this bag, I have these blocks. And they're simply going to represent a mean. The means can be placed anywhere on the number line appropriate to the mean that I have calculated based upon my sample. For this number line to make a little more sense, I have looked at our data and determined that there were very few data points that were less than two, and very rarely did they exceed five. So I am going to create a real number line that will give me an idea of where I would place a particular block. If the mean was 2.5, it would go there. Now, here's where I need you to imagine along with me. I need you to imagine that when I draw a sample from my, my infinite population, that there are 30 scores in this sample. It is very important for this illustration that the sample size is always the same. It does not always have to be 30, but the sample sizes must be the same for this to work. So I'm going to draw a sample, add up the scores, get a mean, and then I will replace into my infinite population and draw another sample. What I will do with this sample is add up all of those scores and they become a mean. That mean is 3.3, and so it's going to go right there on my number line. I randomize my infinite population. I draw a new sample of size 30, and that also has a mean. It was 2.5. And now I'm going to continue to do this. Drawing 
samples of size 30, calculating the mean, and placing that mean on the number line in the place that's appropriate to the size of that mean. And what I'm going to discover is that there is going to be one part of this distribution where we get more scores. Now occasionally we'll get a very low score and other times we'll get a very high score, but there will be one point on this number line where we're getting more and more. And so I continue to do this experiment. So remember that each block represents a sample mean. And this is a distribution. What we have is a distribution of sample means. We're going to use that distribution of sample means idea extensively in our study of statistics. What you will notice is that this distribution of sample means is roughly a normal shaped curve a bell-shaped curve. What you would probably assume from that is that the population that I am sampling is also normally distributed. Therefore, any set of samples that I draw would be normally distributed. And that would totally make sense. If the population is normal, then our distribution of sample means will also be normal. However, there is more to that story as we're going to discover as we talk about the central limit theorem. But for now, I want to go back into more discussion about this distribution of sample means. The distribution of sample means is all sample means for all possible random samples of a particular size. For our example, we used a sample size of 30. All samples of a particular size that can be obtained from a population. How many samples would that be? How many individual samples of size 30 could I draw from this infinite population? How many samples of size 10 could I draw from a population of 100? And you might do that math in your head and say well, there are 10 samples of size 10 in a population of 100, and that would be incorrect because if I draw a sample of 10, put all of those numbers back in the bag, draw another sample of 10, nine of the original numbers are still represented and one number is different, that is a completely different sample. When we are sampling with replacement, as we do for an infinite population, there are an enormous number of potential samples. Out of 4,000, a population of 4,000, how many samples of size 30 could we calculate? We'd have to go back to our Excel spreadsheet with permutations and combinations to find out how many that would be. It would be an enormous number. So we're talking about not a distribution that is this size, but massive distribution of our sample means. We chose a sample size of 30 for this illustration, but we could choose a sample size of 100 or 500 or 1,000. What we'll note is there is more sampling error in small sample sizes. The point estimator from a smaller sample is not going to be as informative as the point estimator from a larger sample because as sample size increases, sampling error decreases. And along with that, the distribution of sample means becomes more normally distributed. Here are three distributions of sample means that I've drawn randomly from our population. We see that when the sample size is 30, that this distribution does not look a lot like a normal curve. There's a hint of normality, but we could do much better. Increasing the sample size to 100, we're clearly seeing the normality emerging. A sample size of 1,000, the normality of the curve becomes quite obvious. The takeaway is that as we increase sample sizes, we decrease sampling error and we increase the normality of our distribution of sample means. But there's still more to learn about this distribution and we're going to look at the central limit theorem that is going to expose something that is completely unexpected. 
let's go there next.